everyone. This is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media. We got a great show for I'm all really of you today. today. I'm really excited too. I want to keep this intro fast and great. So first, let me give it up for my co-host, Daniel Upker. Banging the board is Gunner, who's always doing a fantastic job. And everyone, give it up for the incredible, outstanding, awesome Kira McCown. But Woo! she's identified as Jose today. You're right. She is. <laughs> Gunner. Who's I could be Jose. Gunner, yeah, always, always, always doing a fantastic job. Gunner, who's me. always doing a fantastic uh, no, job. No, 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 that, that wasn't. That we'll was take that back. Purpose. We'll take that back. Yeah. I shaved my facial hair. But, but, but nonetheless, we got, we got a great show. If you want to learn more about Hard Lens Media, please check out our website, hardlensmedia.com. Uh, check, uh, uh, check out the link in the description box below. If you want to get our awesome merch, check that out as well. It's in the description box below. I got the, I got the shirt. He's right? wearing the awesome shirt. So there we go. Boom. Boom. Right there. Uh, and you can find all social media links there, too. We are on uh, Spreaker. We are on, on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Spotify. We're on iHeartRadio, iTunes. And uh, if you want to help out Hard Lens Media, please consider being a Patreon supporter. That link is in the description box below, too. Uh, again, I want to give this shout-out to this one individual, Mitch Osborne. Uh, you went from $100, $77 per month to $200 per month. And, um, thank yeah, you, thank you, dude, yeah. um, seriously, thank you. We do appreciate you. holding up a seventh of the patron. Yeah, thank basically, you. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been really helping us out a lot, and we are very grateful for your support. Um, again, anyone, like, we're only asking for a $1 donation. If you guys want to do more than that, that's, that's fine. If you have fine. some discretionary income. That's, that's fine. Um, but let us, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. And also another shout out to Oopsie. Went from one dollar per month to five dollars per thank month. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, seriously, to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. And if you cannot become a Patreon supporter, we understand. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Plus, stay tuned uh, because at the end of the show, we actually have an activist, Shauna East, who, who's actually been on our show a few times. But we're more than happy to reintroduce her to all of our new subscribers. She's an activist, a community organizer. There's a lot I want to talk to her about, especially with her movement to poor people's campaign and what she's doing uh, with that, and so much more. But with that being said, we're running short on time, and we got to move now super, super fast because we got a story to talk about. So, uh, Gunner, with our first story, um, this has to basically hear about a financial bonus uh, coming from the top 1%. So huge shout-out to Case Study QB who found this clip. Gunner, would you mind playing um, that video? Sure. Grateful for that. Danielle, the one thing that came through loud and clear to me in the Fed chairman's remarks is he's open up to more stimulus. He's open up to more fiscal stimulus, more to what the Federal Reserve can do. Last time I checked, we're running an enormous deficit on top of an enormous debt. But I guess that's just going to continue to be the case. What do you think? I think that, the, that Chair Powell was saying the printing press is waiting for you, Congress. Just pass that stimulus and we will monetize the debt just as quick as you can say, go. And what's interesting, though, is that he's speaking about the income disparity, inequality that's opening up, answering many senators' hard lines of questioning, Senator Warren, for example. Uh, but he's not able to articulate that Fed policy really can only uh, help rescue the corporate sector and investors. And it really does come down to Congress and the only role that the Fed can can effectively play for the little guy, so to speak, is printing that stimulus money, buying those treasuries up. So there's an interesting distinction going on as you see the stock market going haywire because the Fed's going to come in and buy junk bonds, as you were saying, uh, versus what it can actually do to help out uh, em em employees on the ground, which is its second mandate to maximize employment. Um, Danielle, uh, it, it seems like even conservative groups, you know, wince a little bit at this added spending. One in particular is saying enough already. But by and large, most who want to see the president get reelected or improve Republicans' chances are throwing that aside and saying, all right, whatever it takes to close the deal in November, and then we'll think about this stuff. Um, what, what do you make of that? So right now, there's a lot of winking and nodding going on, right? It's, it's a, you know, they're, they're saying no right. to the extra $600 a week going forward. But at the same time, you know, we, we're hearing from the president that there might be a bonus. It's like, we're going to give you a bonus payment, voters, to vote me into office. And then we'll talk about fiscal frugality after that. So it, 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 it's like they're trying to, to thread a needle between universal basic income and an extra $2,400 a month versus giving just a little bit more stimulus just to make people feel better, get through the summer, get into get get, get into voting season. So, 
So, okay, so I just wanted to, because I know uh, we were talking uh, about this before the show started, and I know Kira has done a lot of research on this uh, story as well, but I just want to give my commentary on this real quick. Um, this is, um, of course, a, a, play, a power play move by Trump in many ways, because if he could do a temporary UBI between now and November, it's enough to probably maybe placate some voters or build up his support. And now, is it enough to really help him secure the election? It is yet to be seen. But in all reality, when this crisis first started way back even in January, we should have been doing an emergency UBI for all Americans. There should have been something put in place. And now that it's being used as a tool for Trump, well, what it tells me is that they could have done this from the very beginning. Congress, Trump, everyone. They could have done this from the very start, but they chose to drag their feet. And let's be real. Right now, there's millions of Americans at risk of losing their homes, being kicked out of their apartments. There's 40 million Americans right now that have filed for unemployment. All the old jobs right now are still shut down. And again, we're potentially entering into a second wave of COVID-19. This is nothing to laugh about, but this emergency UBI should have been done from the beginning. Kira, I want to hand it next to you. Yeah, absolutely. So what we keep hearing in these stories also is that we, you know, we can't possibly give more money and put it in the hands of the people because, you know, eventually those people, the middle class and the working class are going to have to pay it back. And we all know that money isn't free, right? And so I just want to kind of beat a dead horse today and just point out that the richest 400 people own $3 trillion. With 3% of their wealth, we could test every American for coronavirus. Um, with 5% of their wealth, we could provide $1,200 to every household. 5.7, and this is only the top 400 uh, Americans, wealthiest Americans. 5.7% lift every American out of poverty. Um, uh, with 6%, we could refund all taxes for 2018 for everybody who made under $80,000. With 8% of the top 400, uh, uh, Americans' income. Uh, it would provide water and toilet access, clean water and toilet access for every human on earth. 43% of their wealth, we could give $10,000 to every single American household, which would make a huge difference for a lot of people. And 85% of the top 400 Americans' wealth would do all of that and still leave all 400 of them as billionaires. So please spare me the conversations about working class and 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 middle class having to foot the bill we don't have to foot the bill it's just that the mega wealthy are not willing to hand over any of their wealth so then i was like okay well what's wrong with printing money and putting it into the hands of americans right well this book uh sacred economics uh by charles eisenstein he explains that standard economics says inflation results from an increase in the money supply without a corresponding increase in the supply of goods. How then to increase the money supply? In 2008 to 2009, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to near zero and vastly increased the monetary base, base without causing any appreciable inflation. That was because the banks did not increase lending, which puts money in the hands of people and businesses who would spend it. Instead, all of the new money sat in excess bank reserves or sloshed into equity markets, hence the rise in stock prices from March uh, to August of 2009. It is no wonder, given the lack of credit worthy borrowers and economic growth, because of course nobody is worthy to borrow money right now because everybody's broke, that low interest rates have done little to spur lending. Even if the Fed bought every treasury bond on the market, increasing the monetary base tenfold, inflation still might not result. To have inflation, the money must be in the hands of the people who will spend it. Is money that no one spends still money? So what's wrong with inflation, right? The Fed's bailout programs mostly put money into the hands of the banks where it, is re where it has remained. In times of economic recession, to get money to people who will spend it, it is necessary to bypass the private credit creation process that said, thou shalt have access to money only if you will produce more of it. The main way to do that is through fiscal stimulus. That is government spending. Such spending is indeed potentially inflationary. Why is inflation bad? No one likes to see rising prices, but if incomes are rising just as fast, what harm is done? The harm is done only to the people who have savings. Those who have debts actually benefit. What ordinary people fear is price inflation without wage inflation. 
If both prices and wages rise, then inflation is essentially a tax on idle money. So that is why the, the, the wealthy, the mega rich and our leaders refuse to put money in the hands of the people. Because either way, whether it's they create money and put it straight in the hands of people, or they just do a, pro, a, a progressive taxation, it takes the money out of the, of, of the wealthy's, uh, you know, incubated bank accounts that do absolutely nothing and don't get spent. So again, well said, Kira. It, it goes to the same point, again, to beat another dead horse. There's so many yeah, dead horses keep, in this studio yeah, I know. right now. I apologize to all the horse lovers out there. Um, when you, it's, it's the, the, it's like, we're even, even when we're even talking about this wrong, the, it's not, the question is, how do we best help the American people spread money? And maybe they're like, well, if we help the rich trickle down, you know, blah, blah, blah. The question is, how do we keep the wealthy as padded and wealthy as we possibly can? Because Kara's completely right. If, inter if, if wages go up and they're matched by interest, you don't feel it. Um, in fact, if wages go up a little faster, which is sort of the situation we're talking about, that's really good. Mm -hmm. But if you have a thing that's getting 4% return a year and inflation goes from 3% to 6%, you are now looking at going from gaining a percent a year passively by sitting on a giant hoard of treasure to losing 2%, which you might actually have to do something with because maybe the stock market... We were literally just covering a story uh, as we were setting up that we didn't, didn't make it into the show of this 20-year-old kid. Like you said, Kira, no one's getting loans now. Somehow he was able to get access with like, basically no money, a three quarters of a million dollars in equity to use on the stock market. 20-year-old kid killed himself because he went in debt. So yeah. I just want to you know, just give a final note to this story. They have the power to help out their citizens. They have the power to do so. They choose not to because their number one constituents for Congress and even President Trump are the top 1%, big banks, major corporations. They'll bail them out before they bail us out. So I know that Kira and Daniel have said everything that needs to be said. You all saw the video, and we've beaten enough dead horses. But just on, end it on a humorous note. My alligators, they eat the rich. So <laughs> let's just make sure that we keep well, on running. Like that. and that's let's, right. let's keep on running with that notion, because I way, think it's time to eat the rich. That's why he has four of them, so they can corner the rich people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. No escape. So, uh, I bet they're so delightfully marbled. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, so it's, um, it's like, imagine, like, would that be like Kobe beef level? Like, with rich people? Maybe. Like, I'm, just, I'm curious. I'm asking for a friend. But, uh, but <laughs> an, alligator, an alligator alligator friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that being said, again, thank you guys so much for uh, uh, joining us for the show. But we now are going to move on to our next story because Kira, you got a story for the people. What is I do. going on? You know. So um, I saw an Onion article yesterday that was titled "City Enters Phase Four of Pretending Coronavirus Over." <laughs> and it, it made me laugh because I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of what's happening. And then the even more hilarious, maybe not hilarious part, uh, is that The Hill is now reporting today that Governor Greg Abbott of Texas is continuing to re its reopening phases, allowing restaurants to use 75% of their capacity and allowing most businesses to operate at 50% capacity or more, even though Abbott reported that 2,622 people tested positive on Tuesday for the coronavirus, a new daily record for the Lone Star State. The prior record had been uh, set a week ago on June 10th when 2,504 people tested positive. So Governor Abbott on Tuesday urged people to stay at home as the state registered the highest number of new hospitalizations due to the coronavirus, marking the fifth consecutive day of rising hospitalizations. The state's Health and Human Services Department also uh, reported that 2,518 lab confirmed COVID-19 patients are currently in Texas hospitals up from 2,326 on Monday. Hospitalizations have been a steady upward trend since May 25th, when about 1,500 people were hospitalized. So mm -hmm. Abbott also stressed yesterday that the Texas medical system has more than enough capacity to deal with the surge of hospitalizations. Um, they uh, reported 14,993 available hospital beds, a 78% increase since mid-March. And, and Abbott said there's only one county in the state where 10% of hospital beds are taken up by COVID patients. Um, the average is 6.3%. So state officials said hospitalizations remain at a, quote, manageable level, and that the system is not at risk of being overrun by new COVID-19 patients. He says, quote, there's been a nationwide effort to slow the spread of COVID-19 
so that we prevent hospitals from being overrun. The goal has been achieved. So what do you guys think about this? And it's actually a point my brother made to me over the weekend when I was visiting him. He says, well, the whole reason for sheltering in place was so that our hospitals don't get overrun, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, everybody's going to get COVID. So we might as well just get over that fact. And, you know, as long as hospitals aren't being overrun, then it's fine. But what are your guys' thoughts um, about that logic? All right, go first, Ben. So your, 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 your brother actually shares a very similar sentiment to me, but what he actually means by it, I don't know if I mean the same thing as he does when, when I say that, because that's the whole idea of flattening the curve, is that you spread out the length it takes to get people um, sick so that hospitals uh, can manage, because if hospitals can't manage you, the death rate is way higher than if hospitals can manage you. And if you're going to get it anyway, which I think based on the length that it takes for vaccines to get make, isn't an unreasonable thing to say. Now, what I think is happening in Texas is a lot of wishful thinking that they're like, oh, yeah, no matter what happens, we've clearly been uh, listening to the scientists this whole time when we haven't taken any of their advice seriously. We've opened up beds. And I want to remind everyone, it's America. Not everyone has health care, especially the people that are out of work. Yeah. So they're what we call uh, boned. And then we have, as we've been talking about, when August starts, which it, it's going to be spreading for a good month, month and a half, a little more than that, uh, as we've seen here in the, in the states that have already gotten it for the most part. We already, we've already talked about in August that everything is going to just collapse basically in real time because all the money that's keeping Americans afloat is going to wash out. So if you didn't have health care then, you're definitely – now, you're definitely not going to have it then. And so even if the hospitals don't get overrun, which I'm not even giving them the credit to say that that's the thing that will happen. We're going to have to wait and see on that. My point is that so many Americans can't even get to a hospital to start with, and then on top of everything – we don't test people in any real way, and that's even right. more true in the southern states and as well. So we don't even know what these numbers are. They don't know what the numbers are. They don't care. To go back to your original point you were making with this story, it's an Onion article. Everyone's pretending <laughs> that this is over and going yeah. through motions that probably will yeah. not help. So I just want to uh, add this commentary in. Um, we have been taking this entire crisis about COVID-19 very serious. This is a virus, as it stands right now, no cure, no vaccination. And there's a reason why we always were bringing up the fact that there was to be a second wave, because there's all, history has shown us time and time again when pandemics like this happen, there's a first wave and there's second and a third wave that will follow. And I hate saying this, but this crisis, we are not out of the woods yet. This is only the beginning. And I am dreading the months of August because if it is true, if, if, if what we are theorizing might happen, we could be seeing a fundamental collapse of the healthcare system, our financial system, our entire social society in regards to just how deadly this virus is. And what we are dealing with is the overwhelming power of nature. And I know that there was such a super rush amongst the right to, you know, reopen everything. We saw those protests where they're storming state capitals and no one could tell them what to do. And, you know, the normalcy that we once knew is not coming back. It'll never come back. And with these police brutalities that we've seen, these protests were bound to happen. What was created here in this country was a boiling pot, and now it's going to overflow. And this is what happens when we have a neoliberal government that doesn't care about its people, that only caters to the top 1%. So there is going to be a fundamental collapse. There's going to be a collapse of likes of which we've never seen. And a lot of people are going to get hurt. So what is the solution? The solution right now is, is in us. We must take care of each other and our communities, our friends and families. And whatever which way you can, whether checking on, on a neighbor, helping deliver groceries, or making sure your community is okay, because we need to start planning now. And time is running out. And we have to be self-aware and understand that if we are going to survive this crisis, we must band together as humans, as people. Because that's how we're mm -hmm. going to make it through this. Yeah. So. And just a little update. The CDC is now reporting nationwide that there are 2,132,321 cases and 116,862 total deaths and in the United States alone. And that number is rising up. And I know certain states like New York, Illinois, and a few other states that really were tough on the lockdown um they're somewhat decreasing and that doesn't mean that they're safe no there's, there's no such thing especially in this time and age but we're seeing other states where the numbers are slowly rising up 
And I am dreading that because a lot of these rural states are where we get our agriculture from, our food supply. And if they go down, if they truly do suffer a true outbreak, um, it'll, be, it'll be very devastating. And I know I like to be an idealist, but the only way we can truly survive this is by banding together. Because if we do this alone, we'll all fall alone. So with that being said, I want to switch it over now um, to Daniel. You have a story for the people, and maybe this might lighten people's moods up just a little bit. <laughs> what is going on, Dan? Okay, so this is one of the most ridiculous like situations. It's, it, it made me laugh. It's one of the funniest things that uh, I think we've covered in like a month. Uh, and this has to do with these uh, snowflake cops and their... Snowflake cops. That they I, just, I just love this story so it? much. It's so yeah. many things at once. So this is about the uh, police um, accusing Shake Shack of poisoning them when, when they didn't. What? So uh, here's the crazy thing. I'm, I was looking through this article. You know, we usually read through the articles. Uh, about two-thirds of this I have highlighted. I want When I read this, I want you to remind yourself this isn't like anarchists are us this isn't like a left left wing organ this is a business insider article ready mm. on tuesday the twitter account for the new york city detectives endowment association uh, shared an urgent message three nypd officers were quote intentionally poisoned at a shake shack in manhattan <laughs> this attack uh, at the hands of sinister essential workers made waves online. Remember, this is Business Insider. To no one's surprise, it was soon determined that there was no criminality involved in the incident. Instead, these workers were guilty of first-degree cleanliness, a felony in the state of foregone conclusions. As it turns out, employees had recently cleaned a milkshake machine, and some residue from the cleaning products accidentally made its way into the milkshake ingredients, something that happens all the time. And that's why McDonald's <laughs> milkshake machine is probably down most of the time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they're always so cleaning it. This isn't Personal the first vendetta, time. Huh, yeah. Daniel. <laughs> I actually haven't been to McDonald's in 15 years. I just know that's popular with the kids. Uh, what? <laughs> this isn't the first time police Pop have it. accused. We have a we have a we have a McDonald's related part of this later. Uh, we ha this is the first time police have accused workers of messing with their food. Uh, police officers in America have a bizarre relationship with accusations of food tampering. And in a lot of cases, they're either wrong or lying. This is Business Insider again. Uh, Vice's Katie Away wrote that these accusations, quote, don't have to literally be true because to the law enforcement officers who tell them and the people who share them, they feel true. It's that truthiness. It's that, what is it? We, we keep uh, facts above your feelings? No, no, no. It's just keeping feelings above facts. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't that's the way that we, that's, talk well, that's how we deal with law and order in this country. So despite these accusations being false, the message is already cemented. In this case, Paul Jimica, whatever his name is, the president of the Detectives Endowment Association sent a message to officers that police were under attack. Uh, it's cops versus the world. All of this is indicative of one of the ways the police system in America is broken, the constant presumption of guilt by police officers. You know what's really ironic? In the UK, you are actually guilty until proven innocent, yet they act in such a way that you're innocent until proven guilty, and in America, where you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, the cops are like, no, you're guilty. I'm going to kill you, and then get away with it. So, on that I'm going to put it all over social media, like a fact. I'm waiting for Shake Shack to do a defamation suit. That'll be fun. Yeah, Shake Shack I'm should. also curious, I also am a little curious of the, the color of the employees at Shake Shack as well. Um, I, I think I'm sure probably... I, I'm sure they were white as the snowflakes that these cops mm -hmm. are. I'm sure Ooh, they would be white, exactly wow. like yeah. me. Yeah. So snowflake and cops. In, in, uh, the uh, insistence to jump to conclusions based on uh, that logic that has led many avoidable deaths where police officers kill. I love that business that are tied this right back to the uh, to the movement that's happening. Who aren't doing anything? They bring up Philando Castile, who was shot and killed after legally saying, "Hey, I have a." permit uh let me show you the permit and then get killed uh to be rice who was shot two seconds after police pulled up with the with a bb gun 
John Crawford III, who was shot and killed in a Walmart for having the audacity to buy a BB gun in a Walmart. Um, this is the deadly thought process that goes into likening Shake Shack employees to jaded Game of Thrones characters who poison their enemies. I want to say to cops something very directly. I'll do some videos to play, but I want to say something. You're not that important. No one's really going to assassinate you. Shut the fuck up. Let's show this uh, Twitter, Twitter tweet from uh, some of the and, and, and right wing commentators. And, and I'd like to comment to this as well. Okay, too. go first. Uh, um, no, 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 no. Show, show, show the, show the uh, uh, tweet first. Okay. This is this is our our good friend and colleague, of course, Tim Pool, who is Ooh, uh, Tim definitely Pooley. a guy who, as he puts it, always puts facts above feelings. Always has sources that are well thought out and researched, mm. and definitely not just like re like going through a tweet that uh, some guy with a blue check mark wrote and then putting an entire story together. Uh, so he says right here, Shake Shack straight poisoned up cops. They didn't. That's not a true statement. Tim Pool, you gotta, you know. Actually, can we move to the other tweet? That he, I'm going to let Tim Poole explain this for himself. The same people who fought for shit like Russiagate fell for Cor uh, Covington and Justice Smollett and will continue to fall for fake news because they have critical thinking abilities and the memory of a goldfish. Can we flip back to the uh, tweet that he just sent out? <laughs> yeah. Shake Shack, so there's, shake wait, so there's a cops. bunch. There's a bunch of political commentators out there. You have your Tommy Lawrence. You have all the people that, remember, what do they all say? Oh, the left, they're way too quick to judge. Oh, the left, they're snowflakes. They'll take anything and make a mountain of it. Not us. We're taking a fake story that never happened and broadcasting it to the world without any evidence, anything corroborative, any investigation. We're the people that always tell the truth. This is... It's it, it shows everything that has happened, everything that these movements, it's the exact same one. It's like people are like, hey, the police are being abusive, and then we're going to protest peacefully. What did the police do? We're going to show you how abusive that we are. What happens in this case? The police are like, well, we have so many things going against us because you know we're, we're sort of causing all these things and shooting innocent people. And snowflakes. And, 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 and calling people snowflakes and not treating people with respect and then shooting them or going or killing them by putting their knee on their neck and never getting caught. But we're the victims. We are the victims because we were almost assassinated by poison that never happened because we're actually really paranoid people. Hold on, wait, Daniel. I'm actually getting uh, a transmission right now. Gunner, I think there's an important video of, <laughs> of, of, some, of some kind of cop crying about Okay, wait, before we play this, before we play this, I want to give you a little context. It, it's, it's breaking news. This woman that Kit's about to, we're going to show this video of, she, in this moment, when this couple hour period before everyone's like, oh, this is all a fake thing, this is how she reacted, thinking that one of her colleagues in the great New York City cop, blah, 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 was almost assassinated. Uh, let's see what she has to say. Gonna play that video. Well, I decided to. Ooh, 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 ooh. I, I did not go to the proper tweet. All right. <laughs> mm? Boop. There we go. Well, I decided to come to the McDonald's at Love's uh, on the Ford Avenue exit. Mm. And I waited in line to get my food. I had already done my mobile order so that, you know, people By the way, she just don't pay McDonald's. for my stuff because I just always like to pay for it myself. But oh, I'm on my way home from work. pay for it yourself. Um, when I pull up to the window, they hand me my receipt, so I go to the second window to get my food, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and so the girl comes to the window and asks me what my order was. I repeat my order uh -huh. and my coffee, um, order, and... They asked me to pull up because my food's not ready. It's uh, an English muffin meal with a hash brown and coffee. Mm, and good. I mean, I hadn't eaten since I don't know, probably about, I mean, I've been up for a very long time, but I haven't eaten uh -huh. in a while. So I was kind of hungry okay. and hey, I'm still hungry. waiting uh -huh. and I'm still waiting uh -huh. and they point. asked me to pull up. So I pull up forward and so bad for uh, a girl comes out with my coffee Wait. and just the coffee just and she problems. hands it to me. <laughs> And I have my window down. Uh -huh. Turn on turn on snowflake mode. Uh -huh. And that's all she hands me is a coffee. She hands you coffee. So I told her, I said, don't bother with the food because right now I'm too nervous to take it. Oh no. It doesn't matter how many hours I've been up. Really? It doesn't matter oh, no. what She's I've done for anyone. Okay, I understand. 
Right now, I'm too nervous to take a meal from McDonald's because I can't see it being made. I don't know what's going on with people nowadays. No, I don't know either. But please, just give us a break. Break. Please just give us a break. Just like break your legs. I don't know how much more I can take. You can't. I've been in this for 15 years, and I've never, ever had such anxiety about waiting for McDonald's drive-through food. So just have a heart, Dan, and if comment. you see an officer, just tell them thank you, because I don't hear thank you enough anymore. <laughs> so, so let oh. me get this straight. <laughs> let me get this right. Your food wasn't ready, and you want us to cry for you and contact McDonald's on your behalf because your food wasn't ready? What a snowflake! And now you're asking people to give you a break? Oh, well, gee, huh? I don't know if you've been paying attention to social media, but the police have been shooting tear gas, rubber bullets, and other projectiles at peaceful protesters, all the while turning a blind eye just a few weeks before to those right-wing protesters who were storming state capitals with their guns, with their weapons, spitting and yelling in the cops' faces, but the cops didn't shoot at them. So you know what? It's a thing called a double standard, and when you are hurting and maiming innocent protesters, peaceful protesters. Yeah, you know what? It's really hard for people to sympathize with a lot of cops right now. And there's a big movement calling to the fun cops because, you know, police budget is taking, what, 50 or 40 percent of numerous city uh, budgets when that money could be invested into our schools, our infrastructure. Hell, you know, I, I think the cops here are going to get like, what, $300 million into their budget uh, for the city of Chicago. You know, Mayor Lightfoot, we still have lead in our drinking water. So I'm not going to cry right. a river for a cop who's waiting for her McMuffin, okay? You can take that. Uh, Officer Karen, hand in your McMuffin badge, okay? Officer Karen. There. I love so it. Because, because, I'm glad, I'm I'm not glad she's sympathize. scared. I want, I'm I, glad she's scared. It's about, it's about time the cops get a little bit nervous for their own well-being, being that, so you know, they, they strike so much fear into the hearts of so many, so many Americans. I was like, okay, well, you know, and if you, if you can't take the heat, Get out of the kitchen. Just quit your fucking job then. You like to work at McDonald's. Stop being a baby. Yeah, get, get a job at McDonald's. Like that, uh, like the girl serving you, who's probably a woman. Please stop calling women girls. Yeah, and you made a good point right before we started uh, this. Uh, here, you're like, you shouldn't be a cop if this worries you. It's yeah. like, do you want do you want this woman protecting you? Is this the kind <laughs> of woman that you want? Not only no. protecting you, getting a lot of money. Pay, being paid more than most Americans protecting you. Hey, what is you guys, this the kind of person you really want to see? This is the yeah. person that you want carrying a gun, trying to feel safe around people, when she freaks out because in another state, someone thinks that they got assassinated. It's all paranoia. These are people that need mental health counselors, not badges. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They need yeah, emotional support ponies. Yeah, they, what they need is a hug. A nice little hug so they know that you're all good and everyone cares Looks about like, you. Uh, and, and uh, uh, Officer hands. Karen's going to have to start uh, doing some of her own food prep, I think. Yeah, you know, at this point, Karen, pack your own lunch. Pack a sack <laughs> lunch. There we go. Sack Guys, lunch. I'm, I'm just really emotional about this. You know, she's a good cop, you what? know, and like this good she she paid for the McMuffin with her own money, right? Like, and hash just, browns and coffee. And get, hash browns and coffee, yeah, right? There right. We go. There but she, she had right she, I'm getting hungry for some fast food, right? She now. had need, so but she, like to summarize, she made a lot of poor decisions, hadn't eaten for but didn't pack herself a snack, which she made yeah. that's when she probably needed those hash browns a few hours ago. Went to a McDonald's, got the food she ordered. Canceled when her own hangry. menu because it didn't come out the second that she ordered it because you know she what? was hangry. I got heard that a, a colleague that was being assassinated with the same amount of paranoia. You know what's really taking these cops out themselves, their own yeah, paranoia. Their own paranoia. And, and now, exactly. and now at the same time, the cops are like, "We're under attack. We're the victims. What are you victims of? Our own divisiveness." It's Wait, like really. No, she no, said no. like, it's, uh, the, "It's the it's the it's the girl that gave us a coffee." Yeah, that's the like, that's was, who it is. It was like By the way. I want to throw out the fact that McDonald's uh, drive through workers have to have way more restraint and professionalism when dealing with people. Than oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And people they, are way I, ruder. Yeah. Also, one other thing, too. You know, um, 
when you know, because I recently I got some fast food. I went to a fine establishment called Popeyes, which is really uh, great. And you know, I, 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 I ordered I ordered like you know that that spicy chicken sandwich or some uh, mashed potatoes, macaroni, some uh, fries. You're, you're gonna do, 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 I'm, I'm so hungry. hungry. I know, I know, I know, I know. But the thing is, like, I had to I'm wait too. I'm crying in a minute. I, I I had to wait too. But you know what? Because I had to wait, you know, they said, like, hey, we apologize for the delay. They even threw in some extra fries for me, too. And I said, oh. you know what? I'm Kit Cabell, the host of Hard Lens Media. I'm going to mention this. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Okay. I didn't say I didn't say the last part, but, but I did get the fries. So that, yeah. that actually did happen. And so now I got, now got a hankering for some Popeye's let chicken me give, right now. Let me give a story. I was, uh, it was a <laughs> long time ago. It was like a year ago. I was out with uh, Kit and Jerome. And we went uh, to look the it was one of the, the Philly cheese place. Oh yeah. To get food, and they just forgot my order. And the guys that were in the kitchen were kind of assholes about it. And instead of going, I'm gonna shoot these people for being mean to me, and I don't trust that they're gonna poison me or not. I just said okay. I went to the front and I said I'd like a refund. You guys forgot my order. Bye. That, it's, it's, if I a, can do that, she said I was all. Get a single tear. I did. How and by the way, you know what else? I was hangry as well. I had not eaten for a long period of time. Oh yeah, that's right. She, we were, we were working hard. She said day, like uh, she was like, oh, I haven't, you know, I haven't slept in a long time and do whatever. It's like, I understand that to be a police officer, you're gonna have, like lose some sleep, right? Yeah. But like that's one part of the job. Also, two, maybe if the cops were like you know, not focused on, like, killing people and trying to just get away with illegal crime, right? Like, maybe they could sleep a little bit better. Maybe they They, could, uh... They they wouldn't need as expensive of a mattress to sleep at night. Maybe maybe if we ended the ridiculous prohibition and the war on drugs, cops wouldn't be as stressed out as they are. You know who needs weed more than anyone? I wonder. Cops. cops. (laughs) Yeah, they do. They need to light it up. Well, it's a good thing they have plenty of it, right? They just plant it on people all that they want. Yeah. Sprinkle a little crack on them. Yeah, man, it could, you know, again... You know, cry us we have some uh, super chats, don't. by the way, y'all. Uh-oh. We do. Yes. So uh, we're going to end that story and move on to the super chat. So story. first, uh, Mona come on up. So uh, $19.99 super chat. Mona, thank you so much for being a good friend of the show. The irony is uh, she's scared for her life because her uniform, but it's worse if you're scared for your life because the color of your skin. But this lady can't take it anymore and wants a thank you. Yeah, that's privilege. true. She could take that uniform off at the end of the day. And right? also the emoji is... Hey, but I thought, uh, she, hey, but I thought she was a blue life. Yeah. She can't take that off. It's always on a weight. No, that's not how it works. And Ayana, $2 super chat. Get this woman an emotional support pony there for fuck's is. sake. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's and, funny. And uh, again, everyone, it's just uh, thank you guys so much for your support. We are very grateful. And for by the way, checks. I want to add one little thing at the end. Go you know on. who has to be more professional than police at um, the people they pull over? have to be more professional than the police. Right. Right. So uh, I am... <laughs> people are talking about my Popeye story. I didn't say, hey, I'm kid of hard lens meat. I did not say we that. We don't have that much clout. <laughs> didn't, I didn't have that clout. Do you yeah. know who I am? Do you know who I am? <laughs> no, I do not, sir. No, who I the don't. hell are you? All right, well, I we, don't we, know okay. you okay. <laughs> we're, all right, we're, we're more well known than many Americans, <laughs> but not to the level that it matters. Right. So uh, we are going to move Speak on. Speak for now. yourself, Daniel. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. We, we are going to move on now to our next story. Um, and this is a you know very difficult story to really talk about, but it needs to be talked about. You know what? Uh, uh, Kit, uh, the emotion level we're bringing to the show is like a coronavirus outbreak in the South. Yeah. Mm, uh, bad timing. All right. So <laughs> let's get started. So um, our next story, um, you saw my brother tortured and murdered on camera. Um Philanise uh, Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, uh, demands a U.N. probe into police violence in America. Um, basically, he went on to state this, that I am asking you to help him. I'm asking you to help me. I'm asking you to help us, black people in America. As, uh, and this is a story that was followed up on Monday. Uh, the U.N. agreed to hold a hearing on police brutality and racial injustice at the urging of a group of African nations that is also lobbying the U.N. to investigate law enforcement violence in the United States. Uh, the brother of George Floyd told uh, the U.N. Human Rights Council that officers show no mercy, no humanity, and tortured my brother that's in the middle of the street in Minneapolis and with a crowd of witnesses watching and begging them to stop. Uh, Gunner, there is a video that's uh, in the article. Can you please pull that up and play it? Of course. Hi, my name is Felonis Floyd, and I'm the brother of George Floyd. On May 25th, 2020, My brother was tortured and murdered by four police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the United States. I thank you for holding this urgent meeting for the opportunity 
to speak to you today. My brother was unarmed and was accused of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. The entire incident showed my brother murder was captured on camera. My family and I had to watch the last moments of his life when he was tortured to death, including the eight minutes and 46 seconds one officer kept his knee on my brother's neck. My brother begged the officer for his life, cried out for our mama, who was already dead, and said over and over again, I can't breathe. Even after my brother was unconscious, stopped moving, and stopped breathing, the officers kept his knee on my brother's neck for another four minutes as many witnesses begged the officer to take his knee off my brother's neck and save his life. The officer showed no mercy, no humanity, and tortured my brother to death in the middle of the street in Minneapolis and with the crowd of witnesses watched and begging them to stop showing us black people the same lesson yet again. Black lives do not matter in the United States of America. None of the police officers were fired for murdering my brother until masses of people in the United States and around the world protested the injustice. When people dared to raise their voice and protest for my brother, they were tear gas, run over with police vehicles. Several people lost eyes and suffered brain damage to rubber bullets. Peaceful protesters were shot and killed by police. Journalists were beaten and blinded when they tried to show the world the brutality happening at the protests. When people raise their voices to protest the treatment of black people in America, they are silenced. They are shot and killed. My brother George Floyd is one of the many black men and women that have been murdered by police in recent years. The sad truth is that the case is not unique. The way you saw my brother tortured and murdered on camera is the way black people are treated by police in America. You watched my brother die. That could have been me. I am my brother's keeper. You in the United Nations are your brothers and sisters keepers in America, and you have the power to help us get justice for my brother George Floyd. I am asking you to help him. I am asking you to help me. I am asking you to help us, black people in America. I hope that you would consider establishing an independent commission of inquiry to investigate police killings of black people in America and the violence used against peaceful protesters. So, all right. To follow up with that, I don't think I have the words to do so. I don't think none of us do. We know that there's police brutality in this country. We know. We saw firsthand police also ransacking stores and burning their own cars and throwing bricks and basically the ones instigating protesters. We saw them use chemical weapons against peaceful protesters. We saw them shoot rubber bullets at peaceful protesters. We saw the press getting attacked and shot at and arrested by the police. We saw that. The whole world saw that. But see, the sad fact is, is that there are more innocent people being killed by the police right now, even as we speak. So I doubt anyone on the UN or, or anyone else is going to see this video, but I'll say this as a member of the independent press. We do need your help. And I know I say this on the show a lot, you know, maybe one day we're going to need help from the rest of the world and the world won't do so, but I, I, I want to be wrong because the American people do need help. We have a government that doesn't care for its citizens. We have a government that only caters to the top 1%. We have a government that's willing to turn a blind eye to corruption and to police corruption and police brutality. This investigation must happen, and the world must speak up. We need your help. It's not only George Floyd's brother that's asking for help. We are all asking for it. Because if this country continues down this dark path of neoliberalism, it'll become something far more worse than an oligarchy. So, yes, we need your help. And I hope that the international community steps up because we're part of that community too. And we all need help right now. So it's not a whole lot you can say that Kid already didn't cover on this. Um, it's very sad this is happening again. It's sort of a travesty that, he ha that, the, that they have to reach out to the UN uh, mm. agency outside the US government to get the government of the U.S., which is supposed to be the freedom and democracy place that the world all looks up to, to um, hold its own officers accountable. Um, 
this well go i go ahead i was gonna say i, I just to you know buttress your point you know who's going to who's going to investigate the police if not some sort of outside force and you know what i what i wanted to say is i think it's important that maybe we start changing the language around some of um the police killings and we should start talking about it that it's our government that are killing americans in the street because that's what the police are they're they're an extension of our government mm. and so it's government officials murdering americans in the street and i think when we start taking on that language it's a lot more powerful and you know what um what mr floyd is saying i can't say i can't pronounce his first name uh, off the top of my head uh but what he's saying here is is absolutely true and i think he's totally right to be going to the un because it is the u.s government killing americans out in the street yeah yeah but i mean those cops have a lot on their on their plates like egg mcmuffins that they aren't getting yeah. and they're crying so about it so you know as, as far as i'm concerned the international community the whole world needs to see this look i'm i'm willing to bet and guarantee that your police forces are trained much longer than ours. And it's, a, and it's a very confident bet that I'm willing to make because it's quite clear that there's something fundamentally wrong with what's happening here in this country. And the rest of the world, you're on social media. You could see it yeah. firsthand. There's no hiding it. There's no denying it. An investigation must take place. Gone are the days of American exceptionalism where we don't need anything or no one should look into us. No, no, no. This has been an ongoing problem. The cameras are on. The videos are on. It's time for the world to speak up. And by the way, you know what else happens in all this since we're talking international? China plays this on their state media. Everything that is happening right now in America is played on Chinese state media. It's played on Russian state media. It's also played in most of the European countries. In China and Russia's place, this is actually, we are helping them suppress freedom in their own countries because China, Russia say, hey, you want democracy? You want freedom? That's what democracy and freedom looks like. It's anarchy, it's police abuse, it's corruption. We will take care of you. Our way of doing things is the right way. You don't need these freedoms. They're going to get taken anyway. They don't actually exist. We are actively exporting the opposite of freedom because of our police. Absolutely. So I think as a final note for that story, um, we cannot stop these protests. And we cannot afford these protests and this movement to be hijacked by the neoliberal establishment. Uh, we also... Uh, can, we, uh, can I, can I just make a... Um, so all day, this starting from this morning, I've been doing a lot of uh, just my own research on systemic racism just because I, I'm not very well versed in it. So I've been trying to teach myself a little bit more. And one thing that I learned that really uh, astounded me is, you know, that there is no like centralized national database for police to report any of these yes. violent things. The only thing, the closest that there is, is the CDC's uh, National Violent Death Reporting System, which is an aggregate of over 600 independent resources uh, that are th just run by, you know, like nonprofits and, and just people who want accountability for police. So I, if you want to start anywhere... That's a, that's a fair point to bring up. So, yeah. yeah, just to reiterate that police count the number of bullets that they fire. They count the number of hours that their police are shooting at the range. They count the amount of overtime they have. They count the amount of people that they've booked. They count the amount of parking tickets, the value of the parking tickets. We but they don't a solid count, count of all of the inmates that we have. They, all they, the they count up the inmates. They know exactly when they're in, how long they're in, what their capacity is. But there is no database and there's no need to record it for some reason how many people they kill. Absolutely. Well, how is a cop going to get another job in the next town over after they kill someone? Yeah. Yeah. Easily. Yeah, very easily. And it's an ongoing Well, without problem. that database, yeah. So here's what we got to do. We cannot stop the protests, and they cannot be hijacked by the neoliberal establishment. We must be aggressive. We must be unapologetic. Yeah. Let's move the, away from yeah. Bank of America f sponsors. Yeah. Insert protest here. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a good path. And, like, it's not enough that you see, you know, police organizations try to do outreach, quote unquote, you know, yeah. they go or, to the neighborhood. That, that, it's it's really PR. I, yeah, I hate, PR. I hate those hugs yeah. that you see. It's just, it's exactly what cops was, which is why I'm happy I got taken off the air. It's yeah. just PR. They're not going to put out this like, Oh, we're here to help. 
when no one's watching. They're only doing it when things are bad for them. Yeah, that's when they're and their McFlurries. It. Yeah. So cry us a river for your McMuffin. Um, so again, let's make sure that George Floyd's memory is not forgotten, and the international yeah. community, please, we need your help. We are now going to move on to our next story. Uh, but before we do, we got a $2 super chat from Kate. Um, just curious, is Hillary Clinton the Uber Karen? I dare say it. Possibly, yes. In theory, ah. maybe. If maybe. you can't have this, if I can't have this country, nobody can. Yeah, all right. But uh, I think we're also running That's, short, yeah, great point. short on time. But I want to hand this next story over to Kira because you got a funny story for the people. What I is too. Going on. I was kind of in a goofy mood today, and I and I I've offered this one up. Uh, as you may have noticed, there are some big things happening in our country right now. There's a pandemic what? that's projected to take 200,000 American lives by the fall. A national debate about race and policing, where the Senate stands at the center of attempted legislative action. Record-setting unemployment. Massive companies teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. And in the meanwhile, Senator Ted Cruz doesn't seem to think there's anything better for him to do than to get into a Twitter spat with actor Ron Perlman, AKA Hellboy, from the 2004 film of the same name uh, and its 2008 sequel. And Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. Or America's Caveman, also known from the movie Quest for Fire. Very interesting. I waited on him while I was in college. Um, oh, you did? A little FYI, yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> my brush for fame. Wait, wait, did he tip <laughs> you? Did he tip? Oh, definitely. Yeah, he Good. Me all right, all right, all right. Ron yeah. Perlman, you get a pass with me, buddy. All right. That's Good. right. Good. Um, so anyway, hey, so at least you weren't giving him a McDonald's meal. That would have been a travesty. Yeah, and I didn't poison him either. But he wasn't wearing a cop outfit, so. <laughs> the, the, the story could have been wholly different. <laughs> Things so, could have been this, 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 this never would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so began one of the weirdest episodes and uh, one of the weirdest years in politics ever. So Perlman was bashing Representative Jim Jordan for his looks uh, in, in a spat around the uh, soccer team no longer being able to take a knee during the national anthem. And then Ted Cruz decided to get in on the action. And he says, quote, listen, Hellboy, you talk a good <laughs> game when you got Hollywood makeup and stuntman, but I'll bet. Ten, I'll bet you $10,000 to the non-political charity of your choice that you couldn't last five minutes in the wrestling ring with Jim Jordan without getting pinned. You up for it? Or does the publicist say it's too oh, risky? That's such so, a hate. I love, so, so I love Jimmy, that he's like, why don't you, I'm such a strong guy. Why don't you don't go wrestle someone yeah, that's not me? I love it. Yeah, so, so he's sending somebody else it. to fight him. Oh my know. God. And then and then calling him like a pansy or saying that it's too risky for him, which is I think is so ironic and hilarious. Uh -huh. And so Jordan, Jim Jordan, a little backstory for those of you who don't remember, or maybe don't know, he was a collegiate wrestler a wrestler and coached wrestling at Ohio State University for almost a decade in the eighties and nineties. Uh, but he was also accused by six former OSU wrestlers of being aware of sexual misconduct complaints made against the team's doctor. And Jordan has denied knowing of those allegations. So I can't imagine that Jim Jordan was very pleased uh, when Cruz reopened, like my, <laughs> reopened oh, that conversation. That's my take on that. It's like, oh, I'm sure he was so thrilled. Yeah. He's like, Ted, <laughs> what the understand. hell? So he should have he uh, written back to Cruz and been like, stop trying to hand me off to an alleged kitty diddler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim Jordan wasn't the, he just let it happen. But hey, if, so, if, if, you know. if nothing matters and Ted Cruz can throw you off to some other person, and when he says non political, I want him to come back and say, I'm going to wrestle you, yeah. uh, but I'm going to want that money for Black Lives Matter. So, in which your is name. basically what he said. So, so, Ron Perlman said, I tell you what, Teddy boy, since mentioning Jim Jordan in wrestling is problematic, <laughs> why don't we just say, Fuck him and make it you and me, he tweeted. Oh, come on, right. I'll give fifty I'll give fifty thousand dollars to Black Lives Matter and you can keep all the taxpayer money you were thinking of spending. <laughs> so so, so <laughs> Which I love. So here's Zing. my response. So, so here's my response. Ron Perlman, you know, uh, if uh, Ted Boy ever decides to man up, yeah, you fight him, but you fight him ECW, extreme championship wrestling style. That means barbed wire, steel chairs, go ahead, fight dirty. 
I'll be the special guest referee. I'll turn a blind eye. Go ahead. Bring whatever you want. You can bring some backup, too. It'll be fun. Yeah. The whole world will love it because should... Ted Cruz deserves a five-finger slap across his smug face. Oh. Ron Perlman, make it happen. And if not, yes. you run up to him and you do it yourself. Okay? I would say that we need to make sure that the front row is just lookalikes of um, uh, the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think it looks like Lemure from uh, Beauty and the Beast, the candle stick mm. with the runny wax face. So anyway, Cruz did respond and he said, I get it, you're rich, but apparently soft. You sure seem scared to wrestle Jordan, whom you keep insulting. Can't take the heat, need to get a manicure. Ted, you're the one responded. instigating the fight. He's the one instigating the fight. keep bringing fight. up Jim Jordan in wrestling. It's which hilarious. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean Ted Cruz, that. what the fuck? Seriously, seriously, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Okay, Ted Cruz is saying Ron Perlman is a punk because he doesn't want to fight another guy, even though he's fight, even though he's instigating a fight with Ron Perlman. I mean, Ted Cruz, are you that much of a little bitch? I mean, are you that? Ooh. I mean, yes. no wonder, no wonder yes. because Ed no Cruz wonder Donald Trump bitch. smacked him around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and so like, so like, and called his wife like, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, he did. And <laughs> Trump said he'd spill the beans on his. And remember, <laughs> Ted Cruz looks like his kids don't even love him. Oh yes, you don't remember that? Love, no one loves Ted Cruz. Every, Nobody, everyone loves, loves, Nobody everyone loves. Everyone hates Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. Everybody hates Ted Cruz. That should be a sitcom for sure. Yeah, everybody hates Ted Cruz. (laughs) Every scene, he just looks like a sad, deflated blobfish. At at the end of every episode of Everybody Hates Ted Cruz, he's crying in his bed alone. (laughs) Oh, and then and then like the and then like the Koch brothers like materialize in front of him. Here's a million dollars. Do what we tell you. Can Ray Romano be in it? I just really want Ray Romano back in an Everybody Loves type segment. I think he really do really well. You know what? His voice annoys me. Oh, no, we should go Ray, Ray, Ray Romano. Yeah, that's I, not Ray Romano. That's like more of a he, he, someone he, else. He, he just he just annoys me. You know what we should do? We should put Ted Cruz in a, a show that's like um, uh, uh, what's the one that um, what am I thinking of it? The one that um, Larry da- oh, Davis. Y- 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 the you know show. the thing. You know the, the show. Thing. The you show. know that really popular what? show. What show? It has the <laughs> do, 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 uh, Is that Curb Your Enthusiasm? Thank you. Yeah. It, we about? should put yeah. Ted Cruz in Curb Your Enthusiasm, except we don't have any good writers writing it. Ugh, no, no, no. Come on. You don't, you don't want to ruin that show. That show's great. No. But Ron Perlman, you are here. I'm going to make an executive decision. Ron Perlman, you are the official heavyweight champion. Not only did you smack around Ted Cruz, but you smacked around his champion, too. Uh, that wrestler with a problematic history, or uh, Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan. Yeah, Jim Jordan. You know, that guy's got, uh, got some problems of his own. So, okay. uh, Ron Perlman, I think we all can agree, is the world heavyweight How long champion. is your video that you want to play next? Uh, it's it's going to be too long, Ron. We're not okay, so we're going to have to do you, that, Do so. you guys want to know who else also doesn't like Ted Cruz? Who else? Just to it? really bring it, proceed it back home. Known Antifa. Uh, <laughs> where oh my God, Baron Trump. Oh. Yes, everyone remember, remember, Antifa is a uniform, yes. not an organization. So there's your Antifa member right there. Let's get, you know what? Let's get that guy to fight Ted Trump. <laughs> Trump is using his exceptional large hands to block the cameras from seeing his son. Well, you can't see. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Wait, wait, wait. I, I figured out. Wait, wait. Ready? I got, the, ready. Perlman needs to tweet out to Trump. To let to officiate this happen, you know Trump would do anything to oh, shit on yeah, Ted yeah, Cruz. Oh yeah, yeah, do it, do oh, it. Yeah. So have Trump Definitely. order it to happen. You know, then we're good. Here, here's the thing too. Uh, shout out to Ron Perlman. I, I don't think you'll ever see this video, but we would like to have you on as a special guest co-host for oh, our yeah. show. Can you yeah, guys just not, 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 not just guest a whole lot, but please? to be a co-host? A special one-time co-host for our Let's oh, That'd be yeah. so cool. That would be cool. So we, we, we have we have no money. And then so, afterwards, so we there can we get go. Baron Trump. I really, Ron, Ron, really, really want to talk to Baron Trump. I'm, there's a GoFundMe that is set up to free Baron Trump from the clutches of the <laughs> Trump family. I am so hell bent on b- having a conversation with this boy. OK, well, uh, it looks like I got to set up a, an elite special forces team. To free <laughs> I wonder if he has Baron another son, Trump. if he's going to have Earl Trump. Uh, I don't know. Ron Perlman. But Trump. Um, we, we are going to now have to end this segment. I think we ended this show on a good note. Uh, because we do have that. our guest. Uh, she's actually waiting. So, Kira McCown, the wonderful Kira McCown. Oh, thank you so hello. much for uh, joining our show. Uh, we always are grateful that you are with us. Remember, the Wednesday show is fun. 
and the F stands for fun in Hard Lens Media. So there we go. Indeed. Uh, I also want to thank. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. Mwah. I also want to give a shout out to Daniel. Again, fantastic job with what you've been doing, man, and all the work that you've been doing behind the scenes. We are making some very special changes, so I uh, can't give too much away. Hush, hush, hush. So uh, with that being said, I also want to give a shout out to Gunnar. Thank you so much for manning the boards. But You're now, welcome let's bring so our much. Guest on to the show. So uh, <clears throat> let me just go ahead and do the live switch out and also message our guests too that we are ready to. So just let me know when that is happening. All right. So uh, let me do my quick filibuster. You love filibustering. All right. So filibuster, filibuster time, filibuster time, filibuster time. Uh, so uh, to all our viewers and subscribers, uh, we want to thank you guys so much for joining uh, Hard Lens Media. Uh, you guys are the main heart and backbone to everything uh, that we do here. And we are just grateful for all your support. So if you want to become a Patreon supporter, uh, the link is in the description box below. Uh, we are only asking for a $1 donation so we can get to our $2,000 uh, per month goal so we can maintain our studio, update our gear and equipment, and work on future projects. So uh, with that being said now, I am proud to introduce a guest who's been on our show numerous times now. For our new viewers and subscribers, uh, you guys might one day want to check out some of our older work and you'll see some very familiar faces. But returning back to your show is Shauna East, so let me do a transition right now in three, two, one. Hey everyone, this is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media and I have a very important special guest and I'm happy to reintroduce her to all of you guys. Uh, she is an activist, community organizer. She's been involved in a lot of elections, especially uh, when we were starting off here at Hard Lens Media. We'd always see her there on the front lines. I am happy to reintroduce Shauna East. Shauna East, for our viewers and subscribers, can you give us a background to who you are and just uh, introduce yourself to our new audience? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, who am I? Interesting question. Uh, an organizer. I've been involved in various progressive campaigns here in Chicago and across the state and some national stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, movement work like the Poor People's Campaign I'm involved in right now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people know me because I was a staff member and then I was a staff member on Bernie Sanders' campaign in 2016, and then I founded uh, Illinois for Bernie before that in 2015, which is a grassroots campaign here in Illinois mm -hmm. to elect Bernie as president. Um, so I don't know. Is that sufficient? <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's sufficient enough because we, we also seen you uh, involved in um, some of the early Our Revolution Illinois uh, midterm election events as well. Uh, we were we were we saw you firsthand as you were organizing the um, Chicago Teachers Union debate, where it's the um, governor candidates who were running during that time. And we right. also saw you involved in some of the local municipal elections in 2019 when uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot got elected. Of course, you were with, with a different campaign, but you were involved in some aldermanic elections as well as a few of the mayoral races, uh, mayoral candidates as well. But right. nonetheless, um, we are so glad to have you back on. So one thing I want to address out first, because I understand that this is a, a little bit of a sensitive top topic to talk about, but uh, recently on social media, you did mention that you are part of the DNC Rules Committee. So a lot of our viewers and subscribers, you know, there's a lot of criticism towards the DNC right now. So at least for what you can say about it, um, what is to be expected uh, with the DNC Rules Committee, especially going in on it? Can you explain, like, really what's going to happen? Because right now there's a lot of, I guess, hostility and criticism towards the DNC, especially with what happened during this election cycle. Right. So... The DNC is supposed to take place in Milwaukee. Um, it was in July, but now it's been postponed. We still don't know if it's going to be in person, virtual, some sort of hybrid. So there's a lot of sort of confusion as to what the convention's even going to look like this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, people online or wherever have issues with the Democratic Party. Um, you know, I was with. Bernie Sanders, who also critiqued the Democratic Party. And I think that's why it's important to have folks from Bernie's campaign represented there so we can, you know, make sure to push uh, progressive issues and perspective as much as we possibly can. There are limitations because of the amount of delegates. Right. Um, right. He still hasn't, uh, Bernie still hasn't reached the 25% threshold 
um, where we're able to make more of an impact if he does. Um, so we're really fingers crossed. So please tell friends in other states to still vote for Bernie because it does matter yes. um, on these committees, especially is where a lot of work is being done. Um, so oh, good, there's, good, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Continue. Okay. There's three committees, um, platform, which will handle sort of like the policies that are going to be put forth by the Democratic Party, like Medicare for all versus whatever Obamacare, that's going to be something, you know, I anticipate will be happening. Those kind of debates mm -hmm. on like the Democratic Party's platform. Um, the Rules Committee basically issues issues a report re recommending permanent rules of the convention. So we sort of set the agenda for the convention. We deal with the rules of the, we make amendments to the Democratic Party charter, like these sort of like technical details that really make a difference. And, and on that committee, um, the big push is going to be regarding superdelegates, <clears throat> like the Unity Reform Commission a few years ago, um, I helped with that as well when I was doing work with our revolution, but I don't know if you recall the Unity Reform Commission was put together, comprised of delegates from Bernie's campaign, Hillary's campaign, and some appointees by Tom Perez. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, we went over things to try, the Bernie campaign was pushing more progressive reforms and, you know, we got a lot of pushback and, the big outcome of that was that we made it so that we couldn't get superdelegates eliminated, but we were able to get superdelegates the role minimized so that their vote supposedly would not count until the second round at the convention. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a pretty you know big accomplishment, even though it doesn't sound like it because I know people want them to be gone. Um, I do, but so that's going to be back on the table again because it wasn't a permanent change. I understand. So that's going to be like a huge thing for the Bernie campaign this time. And then um, among other things, people might want to talk about other issues with elections. Um, uh, there's going to be talk about who the officers are going to be of the DNC and stuff like that. And right. then the last is credentials committee, which talks about um the seating of the delegates so they'll go over like how many delegates were bernie's and how many were biden's in each state and making sure that all that stuff is allotted properly so um in a nutshell those are the main uh fights happening in the different um in the different committees mm -hmm. and then there's of course you know the voting for the candidate vice presidential candidate and a lot of different meetings that people involved with the Democratic Party would have if it was in person, and it might just look completely different if. Right, it's and, not. and again, to be very clear, with the ever-growing risk of COVID nineteen, it's probably looking like uh, the convention as a whole will probably be done online. Again, anything can change, and of course, I would like to do a follow-up interview with you, or at least discuss with other people who were there on the ground as well, just what exactly happened, because. I think we both still have haunting memories of what happened in Philly in 2016. But uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's, that's I a kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think, yeah, we, we, we were all there basically. And uh, it's interesting enough, a lot of people who I've interviewed on the show have uh, also were there in Philly as well. So that's, that's a story perhaps for another day, maybe a special segment for Hardlands Media. But nonetheless, uh, I do appreciate you at least telling us a little bit about the Rules Committee and what can be expected, but I would like to talk to you perhaps later on after the convention yeah, is done. I mean, just I'm, just what is happening. But I'm I, actually feeling like it might be partially in person. So the, from the information I'm getting, I don't have any hard information, but mm -hmm. it might be some sort of like hybrid thing where if it's a meeting of X amount of people, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just very hard to organize anything when we don't know how we're going to be meeting. So stay tuned. <laughs> I think so, and I think it's I think it's um, I, I have my own opinion and 
criticism about the DNC and how this convention might turn out, but I am curious to see what exactly happens in the long run. But now I want to switch things up because uh, besides being part of the Rules Committee, you've actually been really active, and I want to let our viewers know about this too. You've been active in especially in regards to community organizing and grassroots activism, and you are part of the Poor People's Campaign uh, here within the state of Illinois. So I think it's important that we look past this election cycle and look what's going to be happening in 2022 as well as in the next city municipal election. So in regards to the Poor People's Campaign, what's exactly happening here in the state of Illinois? Because we, like, we've covered so many times that there's so much corruption, lack of accountability, and people are suffering, especially in some of the low-income communities, not only in the city of Chicago, but statewide. So uh, can you just give us an idea, what, really, what, what are some of the areas that the Poor People's Campaign is doing here in the state of Illinois? Sure. Um, so just a little background. I'm on the coordinating committee for the Illinois Poor People's Campaign. And just to, so people are aware of what it is, the Poor People's Campaign was started originally in 1968 by Martin Luther King Jr. And on the 50th anniversary of his death is when um, we relaunched the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Um, you might know uh, Reverend Barber at the national level. He's our co-chair along with Reverend Liz Theo Harris. So they sort of started it all and we're the committee for Illinois. Um, just a little bit about the campaign. We're a multiracial, multi-generational campaign founded on five pillars. So all the work we're doing, we relate back to these sort of planks or whatever you want to call it. Um, principles, ending systemic poverty, ending ecological devastation, ending the war economy, ending systemic racism, and changing the distorted moral narrative in this country. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're working in a variety of areas, like a lot of stuff now to do with COVID falls under systemic racism, I mean, falls under multiple of these. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're right now, the big push um, because it's in just a couple days, we have a huge mass meeting happening. It was going to happen in person in Washington, D.C. Like a million people were going to go to Washington and march on Washington. Um, it's the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March. Um, however, this thing got in the way, you know, the the pandemic and whatnot. Uh, the pandemic, and I guess the second hurt. wave is coming as, as, as well, because now we're due for a second wave as well. So I think, uh, I yeah. I think we're actually in the middle of the first wave. Um, right. <laughs> so, so because of COVID, we didn't want to put any lives at risk. So we are doing it all online. It's happening on Saturday. And it. our goal is that it's going to be the largest digital and social media gathering <laughs> of poor and low wealth people, moral and religious leaders, ad advocates, and people of conscience. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna air twice on MSNBC at 9 a.m. Central and 5 p.m. Central this Saturday, June 20th. Right. And then there's gonna be another um, broadcast the next day, but we're pushing to, because this is gonna be like the big platform where we're gonna launch like what's next. All right. with regards to our pillars and everything. so And I think it is important that we do talk about what's next because um, with COVID-19, I've said this on the show numerous times, there's no cure, no vaccination yet. Here's hoping one gets developed sooner rather than later before this virus mutates into something else. Um, but with the consequence repercussions of this virus is that it has impacted a lot of people's wallets. A lot of people are now... Uh, 40 million Americans have just filed for unemployment. Uh, there is a real risk of people being kicked out of their homes and apartments because, again, lack of paycheck, lack of resources. And, of course, you know, there's also this story going on uh, right now where people who have been recovering uh, from COVID-19 are stuck with a medical bill that ranges from either $100,000 to $1.1 or $1.8 million. And I can't think of anyone within my immediate social circle that has that kind of money at their disposal. So in regards to the poor people's campaign here in the state of Illinois, what's going to be really done to help out the working class? Because we have a city and state government uh, that has a long sad history of just looking out for themselves. I mean, the whole purpose of the poor people's campaign is that we're organizing the poor. Mm -hmm. So it's about bringing all of us together who 
share this perspective and saying like, we've had enough, like we're not going to take it anymore and putting pressure, you know, where we need to, to get what, you know, our basic needs met because they're not, I mean, people are homeless. How can they shelter in place? Right. How can they wash their hands? How can they socially distance people mm -hmm. in prisons? Also, you can't socially distance. So we're working first to fight for those being most impacted that can't shelter in place, you know? So those are two issues like homelessness, poverty, you know, the people being incarcerated through this time, like we're, you know, obviously we would want those people to be freed mm -hmm. um, so that they don't die because people are dying. Like basically our government is saying, you know, capitalism, <laughs> human life. <laughs> and they're saying, you know, capitalism is up here and we're down here and some of us are just gonna have to go and that's the collateral damage. I mean, that's what's happening. And we're just saying, no, right. we are organizing people to shelter in place continuously um, like, don't go back to work, fight, you know, anything you can do to make it so you can work from home. Um, so we're just doing the best we can with, with the people who need the most help right away. Right. So in, in regards to that, um, and we, we always talk about Illinois politics, you know, and we, we try and at least portray at least some, because there are some good leaders in our state government and in our city governments that are really stepping up. Shout out to Andre Vasquez. Um, and then, of course, you know, who's, who's one city, one few city aldermen that's actually doing a good thing, as well as the other individuals who are part of the Democratic Socialists of America coalition who are really stepping up as well. Um, but with, with the Poor People's Campaign here in the state of Illinois, as well as a few other groups, um, have you guys got any outreach from any of the local politicians in regards to addressing these issues of the threat of COVID-19 at the threat of people being evicted? Has anyone within the political class here in this in this state specifically, have they reached out to you guys in regards to what they can do and what kind of legislation they could put forward to protect the citizens in our state? Um, the way the Poor People's Campaign works is kind of reverse. Mm -hmm. um, we don't ask them for things. We tell them what our demands are and we demand that they subscribe to it if you know what I mean. We don't right. do the inverse. So I actually, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are going to be involved with the meeting on this Saturday, the June 20th uh, mass assembly. Um, I don't have that list in front of me, but we have like over 130,000 people, I believe, participating in Illinois alone. Um, so I can get back to you on that. I don't, I'm not sure exactly right. which electeds, but I'm pretty sure, you know, all the I, I know we've gotten support from all of the the socialist caucus, for lack of <laughs> better terms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Andre again, you know, Byron, Rosanna. Right. And we've all and, and we've respectively interviewed them on our show. And uh, I'm very proud that they've actually got elected within the city council, because I think it's I think we both understand just how corrupt Chicago has been. And I think as as an important note, uh, and because there'll be one more question followed up after this, um, but, but in regards towards uh, people perhaps waiting in the sidelines, choosing not to get involved, because um, you've been involved in a lot of activism, you've been involved in a lot of political campaigns. What do you want to say to people that are right now kind of demotivated? Because here you have Trump and Biden, two senile individuals running for the highest office of the land. And I can't see a whole bunch of people being excited about that. But what do you want to say to people who are just choosing not to get involved and just turning away from politics? What do you want to say to those that are just sitting in the sidelines? Uh, cut the crap and <laughs> let's go because, you know, people need help now. Like, we don't have time for apathy. Like, I understand being disheartened. Like, I feel like that every time we lose a campaign or, you know, a policy that we're pushing doesn't happen or some something happens and we're disappointed. Like, I understand that. But like, look at all of the millions of people out in the streets mm -hmm. and like, look at the pressure that we're putting and it's actually, you know, starting to move the conversation and we have to put even more pressure. That's not enough. The conversation isn't enough. It's not enough to make symbolic gestures like, taking down a statue or painting Black Lives Matter on the street, 
Like those things are great. I'm not saying they're bad, but it's symbolic. So we have to push even harder. That's what I'm saying. Like, look at all of the folks out there getting involved right now. And it's like, we all need to be joining them. It's not okay for some people to sit at home and like be online and just sort of complain about the DNC or whatnot. There are ally, you know, we can be not just allies, but co-conspirators right now with folks that are like making a huge impact. Like, you know, Soul in Chicago, Black Lives Matter Chicago, like do something. I mean, you can get involved by buying some medical supplies or different supplies people need and like doing mutual aid. You can do things that are going to directly impact and help people who need it right now. Right. Like go buy a bunch of um, hand sanitizer and you know tampons and whatever supplies and food and bring it to Brave Space Alliance because those people are going out and then protesting and fighting. Like there's just a million ways to get involved and not be disheartened right now. And I feel like the positive thing is that I guess it's Generation Z or whoever's older, <laughs> younger than millennials. They're more progressive than our generation. Like I'm gen I'm the last year of Generation X or one of the last years and then millennials. And I feel like those kids are taking the lead in like many campaigns and in the streets and at protests. And I'm like so proud of them. They're so amazing. They're super progressive and they're just saying like we're not going to take this you know we're not going to uh d deal with you know what the dnc is doing we're not going to deal with this we're you know and we're going to vote so all right well, i just think there's so many w things you could do to pitch in that would give you hope right now because right. so many positive things are happening despite the fact that we're living in zombie apocalypse times. <laughs> well, I, I, w I wouldn't call this a zombie apocalypse. I would say this is more of uh, our Dystopian. neoliberal. I, I, I think I think a neoliberal nightmare. So I think as a final note, neoliberal uh, dystopia. Fair enough. Fair okay. enough. But in regards to this, though, I think because a lot of people might want to learn more about the Poor People's Campaign here in the state of Illinois, as well as Illinois for Bernie Sanders, because it's been doing a lot of work uh, outside of just with the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, where can our viewers and subscribers find out uh, more about those uh, groups online and on social media? And are there any other events that you want to uh, mention to our subscribers that are going to be happening within the next couple of weeks? The big thing I want to push is the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March, which is a Poor People's Campaign national gathering that's happening virtually. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening on June 20th, which is this Saturday. Um, go to june2020.org to sign up and you'll get all the information you need to participate. Um, again, that's the largest digital and social media gathering of poor and low wealth people moral and religious leaders, advocates, and people of conscience in this nation's history. So you're definitely going to love it. I think your audience specifically will dig it and it won't make them feel hopeless. They'll think, DNC what? They'll think about, you know, all the stuff other people are doing and it will be very exciting. Um, the Illinois Poor People's Campaign's website is Illinois the word spelled out ppc.org. So definitely sign up there. Um, I've been hosting statewide calls that happen regularly. Um, they've been happening bi-weekly during the shelter in place, but now we're gonna start doing a monthly um, starting June 1st. Mm -hmm. So definitely sign up um, on our website and attend um, our monthly statewide calls. And then you'll learn more about what we're doing here specifically and how to plug in. Illinois for Bernie, we're in a transition phase because, well, right now we're just helping organize the Illinois delegation to the DNC, um, just getting folks the information they need, coordinating, that kind of stuff. But um, we're sort of in a what's next uh, period, but you can also check out our website, um, Illinois, the number four, Bernie.org. All of these groups are all on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So uh, 
go there as well. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a fantastic note to end it on. Thank you so much for joining us, Shauna East. Uh, clearly, uh, the fight for a better future is going to be an uphill climb, whether it's working for or supporting organizations like Poor People's Campaign or supporting third parties or running or helping out supporting progressives or independents that are running for office. The point is we have to get involved. And I know that we saw you in the beginning stages of Hardlands Media, and you're, here you are still continuing that good fight. And the thing is, this fight is not going to be easy, but we have to keep pushing forward. I want to thank all our viewers and subscribers who are joining us today for the show as well as this interview. Peace to you guys, and let us all do what we can to build a better future. Farewell.